Grace and mercy and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. At peace and content. That, that is our theme for today. And Paul does talk at length about those thoughts and those ideas. But as he begins this section, he is talking about a situation where there is not peace and there is not contentment. Here's what he says. I appeal to Euodia and I appeal to Syntyche to come to an agreement in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you, true co-worker, bring these women together who contended alongside me in the gospel, as did also Clement and the rest of the co-workers whose names are in the book of life. There was some kind of controversy. Some kind of controversy between these people in Paul's congregation. And Paul hoped that it could be solved, that it could be solved soon, but he needed help in doing that. And so he asked his co-worker to step in and try to bring them back to unity. Paul doesn't say what the problem was. And I think that was by God's design. You see, this way, this particular issue could be applied to any time that there was contention between the people of God in the future. And it would happen. It would happen again and again and again. Just about every congregation of Christians faces those times of contention. I remember running into the first such situation that I experienced personally. I was still a seminarian. You see, after you write your first sermon and, and it's approved by your professor, you are allowed to take that sermon and guest preach. I enjoy doing that. So I did it fairly often. This particular time, I was somewhere in central Wisconsin. I, I honestly don't remember exactly where anymore. But I do remember, I got there quite early. You see, this was long before the days of cell phones and GPS navigation. So I was relying on a paper map. Even though I got there early, the councilman was already there with the doors unlocked. After he introduced himself, I quickly learned why he was so early. He wanted my opinion on something. Now, why he wanted the opinion of a 25-year-old seminary student, I still don't know, but there was an issue in his congregation. According to him, the congregation was split in half. Half of the congregation wanted to install new bathroom facilities in the church. The other half of the congregation thought it would be enough to simply put a new coat of paint on the his and her outhouses sitting up behind the church. Now, before you get too critical of this congregation, please keep in mind I have been here for almost 20 years. 
I think if I had wanted to, I could have come up with a more close to home conflict that took place over the years. But the point really is that such conflicts are common. Pretty much every congregation goes through them. In fact, even the congregation of Pastor Jesus had such conflicts. There are a number of times in the Gospels where we read that Jesus had to sit his disciples down and give them a little talk because they were arguing about something or other. Not surprising. It was quite a group of people that Jesus had gathered together. People from a wide variety of different backgrounds. When you think about that, don't you sometimes wonder just what the conversation must have been like as those 12 disciples were locked in together for fear of Jesus' enemies on the Saturday after Jesus' crucifixion? Must have been a lot of accusations and a lot of excuses going back and forth. But whatever the conversation was, it would have suddenly come to a stop. And all at once, Jesus was there among them. Their stomachs must have been up in their throats as they saw Jesus. What was he going to say? After all, they had not been on their best behavior for the last few days. Just four days before, on Thursday, Jesus had asked them to watch and pray with him. They had all fallen asleep. And then when Jesus' enemies came to arrest him, they all ran away, leaving Jesus by himself. And then, just a little later, one of those disciples would declare, I don't know the man. Three times he did that. And then that very morning, that Sunday morning, the women had gone out to the tomb to finish the process of burial. But when they came back, they were distraught. Jesus' body was not there. And they were talking about some angel that appeared to them telling them that Jesus had risen. Well, they were pretty sure these women had really gone off the deep end this time. But now there he was, standing in their midst. But you know what? like that church in central to Wisconsin, before we criticize them too much, let's face the reality. You and I would have done no better. In fact, you and I have done no better. Have there not been times where we have disowned our Savior too? Oh, I can remember times where the Christian faith was being spoken against in front of me and Jesus' name was being ridiculed. And what those people heard back from me was deafening silence. 
Oh, I had reasons. It just wasn't the right time. And after all, they wouldn't have listened to me anyways. But really, was that any different from Peter's denial? And so, for us, as just as well as it was for the disciples, what Jesus had to say was truly amazing. You see, he didn't scold them. He wasn't angry with them. Instead, the first word he said was peace. Peace be with you. Isn't it amazing? He was forgiving them. Which is why he came. Paul talks about that in our text too. Listen to what he says. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Jesus announced that peace to his disciples. He announces that peace to us. But just exactly does that peace of God surpass all understanding? We get it. Jesus forgives us. Well, it surpasses our understanding in a number of ways. One way is when you attach the simple little question, why? Why would he do that for us? Why would the Son of God leave behind his glorious heavenly throne to spend nine months in the womb of the Virgin Mary. And then to be born a helpless child who needed to be carried around, who needed to be fed, who needed his diaper changed a couple of times a day. Why would he then go on to live the life of a servant and die the death of a criminal. Well, we know why. We were all taught in Sunday school. He did that because he loves us. But why? What would have moved Jesus to love me that much? What have I ever done for him? What could I ever do for him that would lead him to love me that much? Actually, as we look back on our lives, all we see is a lot of sin and offense against our Lord Jesus. Sins of action, sins of word, sins of thought, of attitude, of motive. Our lives are filled with sin. Jesus had every reason to just throw up his hands and say, forget it. Why would I do that for them? But he didn't. Instead, his love was so great, he came and he died for us to win us peace with God, to win us forgiveness. Isn't that 
truly amazing. And that amazing truth enables us also to be content. Paul talks about his contentment. He says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord now that you have revived your concern for me once again. Actually, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I lack anything. In fact, I have learned to be content in any circumstances in which I find myself. I know what it is to live in humble circumstances, and I know what it is to have more than enough. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation while being full or hungry, while having plenty or not enough. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Like Paul, we too can be content even if we are in need. We can be content in need because we know that Christ has won for us that everlasting inheritance that glorious inheritance that we look forward to. We know the wealth that awaits us. But you know what? I think it is even more difficult to be content when we have enough, when we have plenty. God taught me that lesson while I was in Ottawa. You see, he gave me a marvelous opportunity. Out of the blue, I received one day an email from one of our Wells missionaries in Sofia, Bulgaria. The missionary in Bulgaria was emailing me because some of the members of that mission congregation were planning to immigrate to Quebec. And he hoped maybe I could help them out in some way. Well, God always thinks ahead. And so, in our congregation, we had a new member. A new member who himself had immigrated to Quebec some years ago. He had immigrated to Quebec from Egypt. And so, since he obviously was familiar with the process, I got in touch with him. Asked him if he would be willing to help these people from Bulgaria who were also immigrating to Quebec. He was willing, so I found a way to get him in touch with the missionary in Bulgaria. Things happened quickly after that. Next thing I knew, this family of three was already in Montreal. And Yosef, our member, had found them a place to live. He had found them an efficiency apartment. Well, since they said they were going to be visiting our congregation the very next Sunday, I had mixed emotions. On the one hand, I was excited to get the chance to meet them. On the other hand, I was more than a little bit anxious because I figured I was going to be eating some humble pie to understand that maybe I need to explain to you what an efficiency apartment is. An efficiency apartment is a room. 
On one wall of the room is a sink and a refrigerator and a stove. That's your kitchen. On the other wall of the room is a fold-up bed. That's your bedroom. Over in the corner is a toilet. Uh, usually with some kind of curtain in front of it for privacy. That's your bathroom. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness. That's where this family of three is going to be living? I was worried. Well, Sunday came around and the Toshkovs made the two-hour drive from Montreal to join us for worship. And I was also right, because I was humbled. But not at all in the way that I had thought. I got a chance to meet Constantine, his wife Monica, and their daughter Elisaveta. And I was humbled because they were absolutely delighted. They could not have been more thankful for the help that we had offered them. That we had found them a place to live. I was humbled because I came to realize just how spoiled I was. Got home after church that Sunday afternoon and I looked around our house and I saw all kinds of things for which I had never even thought of thanking God. I never thought of thanking God for these gifts and blessings because up until that time I was thinking well I should have these things right it's only right and proper that I should have them when really they were all blessings from a good and gracious God and you know what? As I thought it through, I came to realize that is a temptation that is very strong in these United States. You see, from young on, we are raised to believe that we have certain inalienable rights. You know, like life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that kind of thing. As well as a whole bunch of other inalienable rights. In fact, you know, I've run into some people who sincerely thought that our founding fonder, fathers got that idea directly from Scripture even ran into somebody once who thought it was a Bible passage rather than just a quote from the Declaration of Independence. But I got to tell you, you can search the Bible and you will not find God ever talking about inalienable human rights. You will never find him telling us to demand my rights, to insist that there are certain things that I should have. In fact, quite the opposite. Like the Apostle Paul, Scripture again and again tells us that we can rejoice simply because we are at peace with God. And we can be content. That peace and contentment helps me to look away from what I consider my rights 
to look away from the things that I want and to focus instead on what other people need and how perhaps I might help them get what they need. How different our congregation, how different our world would be if we would all turn our eyes away from what I want and instead consider how can I help them obtain what they need. That's what it means to be at peace and content. May God strengthen us and help us all to live our lives at peace with God and content with the blessings that God gives us. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.